Okay, so welcome to the Fiercely Curious Podcast. This is episode number five, and today we have a special guest on the show, and this is Q. And we're going to get to know Q a lot more, um, where he came from, how he developed to have a shop within really less than like five years. Um, and at the same time, just know his journey, understand his mindset uh, beyond that. So, hope you guys enjoy this podcast, and here we go. What's up, what's up? Thank you, how you doing? I'm doing good, man, can't complain, just yeah. taking it easy. Yeah, just taking it easy, that's the best way to do it, right? How you doing? I'm doing good myself, I'm doing right. good myself. Um, so, yeah, yet again, Q, thank you so much for having me um, in your shop right now, at the same time, be on part of the podcast, it's a great thing. At the same time, it helps other people uh, who wants to know more about entrepreneurship and kind of expand their horizon within their own careers. Yeah. Um, so take me back to where it all started for you. Okay. Because you're not from Canada, is that correct? No, I'm actually from Guyana. Okay. I came up here when I was eight years old. Um, it was definitely a little bit of a shock to come down here. The weather was cold. And, you know, I, actually, while I was in Guyana, I, I'd only seen two white people my entire life. So when I really? came down here, it was like, holy smokes, this is different. Like, this is definitely like something else. But um, it, it was a bit of a change, but it eventually worked out, you know, like I got used to it. Canada's a beautiful country. Mm-hmm. I'd much, much rather be here than there. So, yeah, you know, and that's where it all started for me. Wow. So was it just you who kind of packed up and leave or was it your whole family or what was it? Well, I was eight years old, um, so <laughs> I had no choice in the matter. Mm-hmm. Um, my father came down first and then um, my mom and I followed a couple years later after he settled everything. Yeah. And yeah, that's how that worked out. Okay. So you touched down in Canada mm-hmm. and then from there, what was your interest growing up? What were you typically doing? What was your like, what was your thing? Well, you know, it was crazy. When I was in Guyana, I also never heard any hip hop. So when I first came down here, I heard um, Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio. That was the first rap song I ever actually listened to. And I was just in love from that day forward. It was like, and I, everything was hip hop. So my whole life was just, you know, listening to the Tupacs and listening to the Biggies and the Jays. And I grew up like looking up to those dudes, right? So that, that was my thing. Um, I played a little sports here and there, but for me, it was mostly just music. Music, music was yeah. like your outlet, that was yeah. your thing. Okay, amazing. No, that's huge. At the same time, so as you're growing in this, uh, as you're growing as a teen, mm-hmm. listening to music, um, what was your influences? Who was your models growing up? Well, you know what? Unfortunately, um, hip hop doesn't always push you in the right direction. So um, I had a lot of influences that kind of pushed me in the wrong direction, had me doing things I probably shouldn't have been doing. Um, my parents are great people. And they did really well for themselves, but I was uh, feeding off of that hip hop energy, so I kind of wanted to do what they were doing and whatnot. But as I got older, I started to um, look into like entrepreneur part of uh, hip hop. So I started looking into the Master P's. I love what he did. You know, I love what Jay Z did. You know, with his business Before and Rock Nation. Right? Yeah. So I actually started admiring rappers not for you know the lyrics Mm -hmm. but more for what are they doing behind the scenes so like i I was really into nipsey i was in the nipsey since like 2008 2009 yeah so like um but i like i didn't even really like nipsey's music to start off like i like what he was doing i like the fact he was buying property he was doing these businesses he's buying back his block those type of things impressed me so because you know a lot of the rappers look like me it's a lot easier to um relate to what they're doing right so sure. and yeah. he got involved in tech too which is really cool yeah yeah so yeah so hip-hop kind of has been a, a big part of my life even when it comes to people i look up to business-wise yeah. right so for sure yeah i think for me i touch points with a lot of hip-hop artists because that's all i'm seeing that's all i saw growing up yeah who i felt like i could possibly be um like them mm-hmm. but also so much more yeah like kanye for me jay-z mm-hmm. especially uh is it Pharrell for the creativity? As yeah, well. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's cool. So, so we're in a stage of you growing up. Influences were here and there. Mm. Any family influences that influenced you? Well, it was crazy. I never really like had any family influences because I always knew I didn't really want to be like a worker aunt. You know what I mean? But um, as I got older, like I said, my mind started to change. I realized that my pops is a great influence. He's uh, a great man. 
he has a lot of integrity, he has a lot of honor, works hard. Um, so as I got older, he was like my model for like what a man should be, you know? Yeah. Never did anything funny. My dad wouldn't even watch bootleg DVDs. No way. Yeah, like, no, nah, <laughs> he wouldn't watch bootleg DVDs. He's like, uh, one time I asked him, I'm like, man, you need to watch Game of Thrones. He's like, bro, I don't watch pornography. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the type of guy he is. Now I realized as I got older, I'm like, man, this dude is just, he's a solid individual. Like, wow. people always got good things to say about him. Yeah. And his reputation is solid, so I'm like, yeah, that's the guy that kind of influences me and I kind of look to. That's a huge, good model. That's a great model because a lot of guys don't have, yeah. obviously, role models, especially in our community. Yeah. If you're lacking that. Yeah, so. yeah. It was crazy because I, like, I was looking at the rappers as, like, father figures, but I didn't realize I had, like, the perfect father figure right there. Like, he has his flaws. For sure. I get it twisted, but, like, other than that, like, his foundation is solid, you know, and we came into this country with nothing. Like, it was five of us in a two-bedroom apartment, and then he just worked, worked, worked. I remember this dude used to work, like, 16-hour days, come home, sleep for a couple hours, and go back out. And, you know, all that work paid off because now he's doing really well for himself, you know. Like, we got multiple properties. Uh, you know, he could get up and go anywhere that he wants to go. He, he worked his way from slanging boxes at FedEx to being one of the, the senior managers there. So... Yeah, that uh, he was a good model. He was definitely a good model. When did you like recognize that? What turning point were you like, whoa, well, I actually have this role model at home twenty four seven? Probably like my mid twenties, man. Like my mid twenties I was like I was looking at this dude, I'm like, Oh man, like, yo, we came from nothing, like literally in, yeah. in one generation I, like this dude managed to switch our whole lifestyle, right? We could have stayed right in that apartment building, but you know, he wasn't having it. My mom specifically wasn't having it. My mom, when she first came to Canada, she had never seen an apartment building before in her life. And we moved up into that apartment building, and she's just like, nah, this isn't it. I wanted something more. Yeah, she's like, I need a backyard, I need a house, I need this. So that put the pressure on my pops, you know, to make some moves, right? Sure. And that's how it worked out. So they're, they're both a really big influence in my life, and they both really helped me to see things differently, right? Yeah, yeah. that's actually great because, yet again, mm. influences, like, the pinnacle of some success. Right? Yeah, yeah. You need that proper influence, like proper guidance, mm -hmm. and resource. Yeah. So the thing is with me, like I like I respect what they did, but I want to do things my way. Cause one of the one of the issues that me and my pops had was the fact that he would say that you, there's only one way you can make money in this country. You know, you work hard, you stay at the same job for thirty years, you build yourself up, you save a lot of money, and then you know, you'd be rich in your 50s and 60s. For sure. And I'm just like, nah, that's like, you did it your way, and I appreciate you giving me that blueprint, but for me, I gotta do it my own way. Like, I, I need control of my life. You know, I need to I need to have full control because I believe in me. I, I, I believe I could do the right thing if I just execute. So, For sure. that, that was that. And was that self belief instilled from him initially, or was that was something you always had? You know what, I look back at like my self-belief and I don't know if it's natural okay. or if it had something to do with the colorism that I was in Guyana yeah. because I was fair-skinned and um, I always got preferential treatment down there. So when I look back, I, I'm like, it, was that it or was it just always me? I, I wouldn't know, yeah. but I, I know it played a part. But for me, um, I just have a strong belief that you could do whatever you think. Um, I don't. I, to me, it's crazy that people walk around thinking that like they're victims of their life, like like circumstance, like you know, I, the victim mentality. Yeah, like I never thought that. I was like, yo, yeah. if if yeah, this is what I want, I'm just gonna go do it. Like you yeah. just gotta execute it. You know, it's, it's gonna take long sometimes. Sometimes it might not have a right way, but for the most part, if you just put your head down, and you know exactly what you want, and you structure it. That's that's all it is. Like I feel like a lot of people when they make goals, they they have this macro goal, like, yo, I want to do this, yeah. but where's the micro at? Like, I set everything up. Like, before I opened my shop, I literally set everything up. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this warehouse job for two years because I, I need to stack up. Wow. I knew I was going to be poor for my first year of barbering. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that. That took me two years. Then I knew I had to do a couple years of um, apprenticing and learning how to actually cut hair. Wow. It took me the next two years, and then... After that, I felt like I was ready after two years to open my own spot. And wow. That's how I got here. 
I want to really get into that for sure. Mm. And I was just kind of thinking, highlighting here, um, do you think there is, even for me, I'm an immigrant, I was born in, in uh, London, mm -hmm. and do you think there's a mentality of a work ethic, like I call it the immigrant mentality, mm. where you come to a country and you want to work harder just because. I just felt like for me, it was instinctual. I just felt like I had to work harder for some reason because mm. I'm not from here. Yeah. Was that for you? Was that something familiar for you? Or... Well, like, I was too young to really know about that, but, like... Even, like, growing up here, was there uh, kind of, like, a, a hunch for you? Like, I'm not really from here, but I can probably outwork. No. Uh, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't... It was never that. Like, I saw my dad doing it, right? So I was like... I just thought that's just how it was. Like, I didn't know whether it was an immigrant thing or not. I just knew that, yo, this dude is hustling, like... 16 hours a day, yeah. right? So I just saw that and I was like, yeah, that must be what you have to do. That's a foundation. Right? So, and I saw like most of my family members are like that. They just work hard. Like my relatives, my uncles, all that, they're always working, right? So, and to me, this might be controversial to say because I don't know what you can say nowadays, but I think as a man, you ain't got nothing better to do. Yeah. What else are you supposed to do as a man? Like, you gonna hang out, you gonna sit down, watch TV, you gonna yeah. eat and just mess around? No, to me, as a man, you just work because you got to provide. You got to you got to set up the next generations, right? So I agree with you for yeah. sure. Um, so you, you said you mentioned um, that you got into doing warehouse work. Mm. So what was that phase like? What got you into that position to realize, okay, I'm here now and I might want to get out of this. What got well, you into? Well, for me, it was like I didn't I didn't have a lot of a lot of education right um formal education so to me i just had to go wherever the, the money was at what, what can i get the most money out of right so i went to the warehouse uh, a couple warehouses i worked at and man it helped me it motivated me man that it was rough like i worked at some warehouses too yeah man you already know what it is man oh, like yeah. it's it, not fun it's not fun know. man like you know I had grown men like yelling at me and I'm a grown man too. And it's like, you know, like there's so much animosity. Yeah. I remember when I was in the warehouse, I picked up on reading, which is also a big part of my life. And, um, the guys at the warehouse used to get mad at me for reading. They're like, they would like, you know, say, who does this guy think he is reading? He thinks he's smarter than us. And then I was just like, dude, like, yo, I'm just minding my business. Like why, why does me trying to better myself offend you? And, it's, it's the environment, you know, their environment, like, yo, this is what it is. This is their cap. They're satisfied with that. And anybody that come in, that's not like, you know, doing the whole group thing thing, yeah. then you, you outsider. Yeah. I always been an outsider in those environments. Yeah. Even though they were short term as much as you, mm -hmm. I just never felt like I fit in at the same time. Yeah. Just like you're saying, they have their own like culture, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. But to me, that just wasn't going to cut it for me. Right. Yeah. And I always knew that, you know, I'd never be like a, a, a warehouse guy forever. Like, I just knew that like, this was just temporary. I came in, I think that's a very important part. Like, I came in with my intentions. I'm like, I am not going to be here past three years. Right? I just knew that. Like, okay, this is just going to take me, carry me over for a while, but I'm not going to do this past three years. So, I think that's a big part of um, getting things done and setting your intentions from the beginning. Know what your end goal is from the beginning, and that kind of helps you finish things, you know? What made you have that intention of like three years is the max? Then I'm on to something better. Well, I hope I don't offend anybody, but um, I just thought I was better than that. Of course, like, as you should. I think it's having the self value. Yes, yeah. it's good. Yeah, I felt like I was worth much more than that. You know, like I felt like I could use my mind instead of having to use my body. Right. So that's why I knew that this just wasn't going to be the thing for me. Right. Yeah. So you ran it out for two years or so, mm -hmm. and then what was your exit like? In, in an idea for someone out there that may be in that grind and they feel like, I want to move out here, but I don't know where to start, where to go. Well, man, I was on a seven day a week grind with that because what I ended up doing was I was working afternoon shifts and I would go apprentice at uh, my previous barbershop during the day. Mm -hmm. So I'd get up, go to the barbershop, work until about four, and then go to the, the job at 5 30 to 2 a.m and then on my off days i would still go to the barbershop so i was like doing like seven days straight and once i felt like i was competent enough at cutting hair i felt like okay now 
it's time for me to to leave the job. And it was it was kind of cool too because I remember um I told this one particular gentleman I'm like yo I'm I'm, I'm leaving this place I'm not gonna be here. Yeah. He's like oh that's what the, that's what they all say, right? He's like you're gonna be stuck here with the rest of us. And I'm just like no nah, I'm not gonna be stuck here with you guys man like I'm 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 out because this this place actually paid very well like extremely well like it was like upwards of like thirty three dollars an hour if you work with bonus so it was good money. And they're like nah he'd be foolish to leave this job and I was just like no there's just no way so. The day that I put in my two weeks, I went and I spoke to him. I was like, hey, man, remember what you told me? Yeah, man, I'm out of here, bro. I'm about to go do my thing. And, yeah, that was my exit, you know? Yeah, for sure. Wow, so, okay. So you got your exit. Mm. You, I guess you accumulated a certain amount of funds, and that was, like, yeah. your, your safety, mm. in a sense. Okay, and then what got you? So during that period, you were doing warehouse work, and apprenticing at a barber shop mm-hmm. for two years mm-hmm. that was for two years that was for two years yeah wow yeah <laughs> that's that's something that people have to understand it's it's not a six months period no it's literally a long-term goal no you gotta you gotta really plan it out you gotta know the long-term goal like you know i'd give up five years of my life to have a good 20 years wow. you know so yeah. Yeah, that, it was difficult. It was hard, but I liked cutting hair so much that I didn't even really feel like work. I was just cool. I was cool. So getting into cutting mm-hmm. hair, mm-hmm. what is your why then? What got you into it? Why? I was on um, a cruise for my dad's 50th birthday, and I was kind of like at a turning point in my life. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I got up at like 4 o'clock in the morning, and I was the only person sitting at the dock of the cruise. And I'm just sitting there, and I was like, what am I going to do with myself? And I thought about what do I like doing? And I realized that I loved going to the barber shop. And I was kind of like at a turning point in my life. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I got up at like four o'clock in the morning and I was the only person sitting at the dock of the cruise. And I'm just sitting there and I was like, what am I going to do with myself? And I thought about what do I like doing? And I realized that I loved going to the barber shop. I'd go there every week, every single week. and they didn't take appointments, so I would be there for hours just waiting. I didn't mind because, you know, we talk about politics, we talk about girls, we talk about sports, we talk about everything. It was just like a nice environment. And I was like, man, if I could cut hair, that'd be great because I love being there. And also, I like the feeling that I get after a haircut. After I get a fresh haircut, I'm like, man, I feel like the man, I walk different, I move different. So I was like, I want to give that to people, yeah. right? So. I was like, you know what? Yeah, that's that's gonna be the wave right there. And then I was just, I found it and I just stuck to it. Yeah, and yeah. that's the best feeling because when you do come out of the barbershop, you feel like a million bucks. Yeah. Especially when I was a kid, growing up in my high school, there was always a barbershop around. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that was the place where everyone went to. Yeah. Just to feel good. Again, yeah. You know? Yeah. So that was your thing. You wanted to help people feel good. Yeah. That was it. That was, it. That was my why. Like, I wanted to. Um, make people feel good is instant gratification for me because I can make them feel good within like a 45, 30 minute period, right? Talk so, shop too. Yeah. And I also felt like once I got in to barbering, that the sky's the limit. I could take you wherever I want to take it. I could just be a, a barber and just work at a shop for 20 years. I could have multiple shops. I could have a product line. I could do whatever. So I thought like it was all determined on how far I want to take it. And I would have full control of my life and my destiny, right? So that was the big thing. It was more like ownership, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Did you know it was entrepreneurship at the time, or it was more like just a core feeling of, I want to be my own boss? My number one thing is freedom. That's my word. Like, people, I talk about money a lot. Of people are like, oh, you money crazy. You love money too much. I don't care about the money. The physical thing, the money, or whatever, the digits in the computer, it don't mean nothing to me. It's the freedom. What can I do with it? Like, can I get up and go somewhere? Can I make sure I can provide for my my fiance and my future children? Like to me, that's what it was. It was freedom. I don't want to have to be like no, or let's wait six months, or you know, me and my girl are fighting over money. That's what I want to avoid, right? So I knew that freedom was my end goal, and that's my number one word. And so all my goals, including with the barbershop, is mm-hmm. just how can I get the most freedom? Amazing. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the power of one word. Yeah, I have the power of one word for myself too, and that's self care. Mm-hmm. I kind of put that into all my businesses and mm-hmm. my practice. So, freedom yeah. is a great word too. Yeah, it's a huge word. 
Um, so, so through that point of you doing apprentice, you start opening up your own shop after two years. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that process like? Because that's completely new to you, right? Yeah, yeah. It was it was crazy. It was scary. Funny enough, um, I took my father's advice. He told me to to do it in 2019, and I was going to do it in 2020. Now imagine if I try to do it in 2020. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it would have been crazy. That would have been a disaster, crazy. right? So, I did it early. Um, it was scary, man. Uh, you know, I went and I had to go get the permits, and I had to deal with the landlords, and I had to get all these things set up, and the health inspector. It was just a lot, you know. But it was scary. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I just kept pushing. You know, I doubted myself. I was like, "Am I doing the right thing? Did I get the right location?" Like, yeah. but yeah, I just had to do. You know, like, Dude. I just had to do, just keep moving. Yeah. Even though a lot of things were unsure, yeah. I just kept moving. Yeah. Right. I believe in doing a lot. Yeah. Uh, more than thinking yeah. as much. As much as I'm a thinker, mm -hmm. I do is so important. Yeah. Um, fail forward, right? Yeah. Multiple times. That's how you get better. So you opened up the shop, which we are in, which is actually really, really beautiful mm -hmm. here on the lake shore. And I'm curious to know. How was that structure opening up? What did you do? Did you go out to do self promotion? Did you kind of wait for people to come in? Did you do promotion parties? I was extremely fortunate actually. Um, a lot of my clients followed me from uh, my previous barbershop, and that wasn't necessarily because I reached out and I was trying to approach the clients or get them to come to me. But my philosophy was customer service. And every every company wants to give customer service, but I felt like I could differentiate myself by actually caring and actually going above and beyond what they expected, right? And I feel like because I did that, a lot of people were willing to follow me. They were willing to even drive past my old shop. They literally, I have a one guy that actually lives literally right across the street. He could walk across in 15 seconds to my old shop, but he drives past that shop and comes to my shop. And that's not because you know, I'm the greatest haircutter in the world. Uh, it's because we have a genuine relationship and he knows that I actually care about him. It's not just transactional, yeah. right? So um, that really gave me a boost. But um, I also use a lot of social media marketing. There's so much different ways you could market, put things out there. But I figured if I was to put all my energy into social media, it would help me out. Because I don't like spreading myself thin. I want to do 50 million things not getting things done so I just focused on social media so I took social media courses I spent a year straight studying marketing right so I could do it by myself I wouldn't have to pay anybody for it and yeah that was my structure and I, I felt like you know having that foundation of caring about the clients not being transactional you know what I mean and going above and beyond the expectation was going to be enough I didn't really feel like I needed a ton of like marketing and all that those things was gonna make other people come. Yeah. Right. It's, so it's kinda of interesting with even the books I read, I use probably like it feels like ten percent of it. Mm. As much as I read the context, yeah. It seems like you kinda of use the principles later down the road. Yeah. Um, so you're at, you're applying the book knowledge, you're mm. applying like all of it any way you can, I guess on yours as well, mm. you mentioned. Um, so what was your thing? What was what book kind of inspired you the most? Oh man, that's a tough question. Um, I would say Think and Grow Rich, though. If I was to put any, that's like my goal book. Napoleon Hill. Yeah, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. That's like the goal book for me. Like that book changed my life, man. Like it, it allowed me to see things in a completely different way. I realized that I'm in complete control of my life. I don't. It's I can't blame anybody for my for my shortcomings. It's me, yeah. right? And I'm a strong believer in um, you, you are what you think you are, right? Whatever energy you always thinking about, you get more of that. And I've seen it. If I've, I've actually experienced it in my life so much times, sometimes in a negative way, where like there's things that I didn't like, and I would put a lot of energy into thinking about it, and then it would actually happen. Um, funny story, my my fiance. Um, she she beautiful girl intelligent you know what I mean but she has a tendency to have a couple of slips and falls every every now and then more so than the average person and um for the last year uh, before we we're supposed to get married she was thinking about falling on her wedding day 
Now, unfortunately, we didn't get married because of the whole COVID virus. But on the day of our wedding, she fell and hurt herself. Now, to me, that's not an accident. That's not an accident. She put a lot of energy behind those thoughts. She had a lot of emotion behind those thoughts. And so she manifested those thoughts, right? And that's basically um, what the book says, Think and Grow Rich. It's like, you know, you got to think and grow rich. So if you think you're going to be rich and you think you're going to be this person, then that's what's going to eventually happen. I remember, I remember highlighting from that book before and I got goosebumps because it was something you told me mm -hmm. as well. Like, you can see you come to the shop. Uh, you, can, you literally have to write a phrase out mm -hmm. in, in the morning mm -hmm. and get that established for your routine and yeah. then at nighttime say the same thing mm -hmm. as well. And that's like an imprint in your mind. Right? Yeah. That's how you with it. Yeah, yeah. So the, I write down my goals. You know, I believe in all avenues. So like, I visualize. I spend time visualizing. I write them down. I have a vision board. And I like to speak my goals out loud because I feel like all these things have energy. They all have vibrational frequency. So once you do that, the chances of you manifesting are a lot higher, especially if there's emotion behind it too. Right. So yeah. If I said customer service, what comes to mind? Uh, doing the unexpected. Okay. Because in order to operate in a business, you have to have some sort of customer service or you're going to die. So for me, customer service is doing the unexpected. Doing things that they wouldn't get anywhere else. That's what customer service means to me. And along with just doing the basics, right? So. I looked at a lot of the flaws that I find in barbershops and I kind of worked against that. So whatever I saw, wherever I saw like a deficiency in customer service, I like, okay, they're not doing that. Okay, I'm gonna do that 10 times harder. You know, so one of the things um, that I noticed about barbershops is that I walk into a barbershop and I go to barbershops all the time just to, just to scope out to see what they're doing. And they wouldn't say anything to me, which to me was crazy. I'm like, how could somebody walk into your business and you don't address that person. They're not doing you a favor, you know? That's so a basic introduction. Just say hi. So for me, as soon as the person steps on that mat, as soon as that door opens, I give them the most enthusiastic hello I possibly can. Hey, how you doing? Are you looking for a haircut? Things like that. Right, so simple things. Um, Doing a hot towel, you know, putting a little bit of tea tree oil in the hot towel, just the details, going above and beyond what they expect. So. Most people have a baseline of what they expect when you go to certain places. So if you go to McDonald's, you expect this. Mediocre service, mediocre food, you know, but it's fast, right? So I look at people's baseline for barbershops. I'm like, okay, this is where it's at. I want to be here, right? I want to be much higher than what they expected. So that, that to me is customer service, not just the basic, you know, trivial stuff where you just give a fake smile and you just yeah. do things because you're programmed to do that. No, I want us to actually care. I want us to do things better and different than everybody else. And you develop a deeper relationship with the clients too. Right? Absolutely. We're, we're in the relationship business first. Hair comes second. Wow. We're in the relationship business first. Um, people can go to any barber. There's, there's a million barber shops. You know, there's one thing about it, this industry is extremely saturated, right? But it's the relationships that keep the clients coming to you, right? So. That's great. Yeah. I wanted to uh, just mention one more thing. Um, from my experience of cutting this barbershop mm -hmm. and before uh, getting to know you, I started getting a haircut from you and probably one of the best haircuts I ever got. Mm -hmm. It's always been about the detail, mm -hmm. small points in, and you are really good at receiving feedback. Mm -hmm. I think as from a customer standpoint, mm -hmm. some people would feel intimidated in the sense they don't want to offend the, mm -hmm. the barber that I feel like I need to have my hair cut here a little bit or yeah. just their feedback but you're really open to allow people to see what they, what's on their mind yeah and yeah I'm really it. hard on myself too man don't be like I'm really hard on myself like sometimes I take like a video of a haircut or a picture and I'm like damn like I could have done that a hundred times better but it's all about growth right but I'm not afraid of feedback like I want to hear what I'm not doing right, so I can yeah. improve on it. I don't. I don't think like I'm perfect, yeah. you know. So if there's anything I can improve on, I'm definitely open to it. I want to know. I want to be better. That's why I do. A, I take a lot of videos and pictures of my haircuts because it's not because I just want to destroy them on the gram, but I want to study them. I want to look like okay, there's a dark spot right there. Yeah. You know, this this part don't look as clean. 
the client might be perfectly satisfied, but I'm gonna see it. I know my, my competitors are gonna see it. I don't want to, I don't want to see my haircuts and be like, hey man, look, he's doing that sloppy haircut over there again. Like to me, I think about that, right? And sometimes like I'll make a mistake and I think about it for days. <laughs> like I would I would literally think about it all the time, like, man, I can't believe I did that. And usually if the haircut doesn't turn out the way I want it to. The next haircut is what I call a revenge haircut, right? So now <laughs> I analyze all the problems, everything I didn't like. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna murder this one. Like, I, sometimes I even put a little bit of extra time in sure. a time slot to make sure that I could just do way better than I did last time, right? So honestly, I think that's one of the biggest things why I even enjoy the experience here because I seen it, and even when I'm about to leave, they're like, "Hey, Tune, just come right back. I need to fix something up. You know, be two seconds." Yeah, and then you're back in the chair. Put the, whole cape on and stuff yeah, and yeah. get back to business. Yeah, so, if I see something I don't like, man, like, I, I like being on time, but I would be late for that, man, because this is my signature, you know, like, you're going to be, you know, my advertisement for the next two weeks. So I want to make sure that when people see you, that, you know what, Q's work is known as good work, right? Sure. So, yeah, yeah man. Sure. So, Sharp Society, where did the name come from? <laughs> Uh, I think like everybody else, I went through this uh, period of my life where I was into a lot of the conspiracy theory videos and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. And I always liked the um, secret society feel. Like I always thought it was dope. Like yeah. you know, like a secret. Like well, yeah, sure. everybody yeah. wants to have their own thing, right? Yeah, the CIA has their own thing. Too. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? I was originally looking at something like similar to the Mason, but that's been overused in my industry. There's no People always use the scissors and the razor and they put them yeah. like as a triangle and yeah. it looks like they put like a G in the middle or a yeah. shot in the middle. I'm like, I'm not doing that. So I, I did some research and um, I found that a lot of barbershops weren't using the word sharp. So I found that word. I'm like, okay, I like this word sharp, okay. And then um, I was looking around and I saw there's a secret society called the Seven Society. And I was like, okay, sharp society. I put those two words together. Um, my fiance had a big part in that too, so shout out to her. I don't want her listening to this and get mad at me. So she she had a big part in that. You'll be eating for weeks. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so yeah, so Sharp Society just kind of rolls off the tongue. It was just it was just like a, a smooth sounding name. So I'm like, yeah. you know what? That was it, and I'm really glad I came up with this particular name because like, I get a lot of compliments about it. People love the name. They think it sounds pretty cool. I think it just sounds like a, an elite brand. So, yeah. yeah, that's how I came up with it. Yeah, that's the feel I get from it too. Yeah. And I want to talk about the atmosphere here yeah. because this is quite different than any barbershops I've experienced. Mm -hmm. So, what's the experience? I want you to tell me from your perspective and I'll tell you from a client's perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you come through the door, what is your aesthetic? What is your vision here? Um, well, basically most of haircutting is just going from light to dark with, a, with as few flaws as possible. So to me, that's very similar to art, right? It is art, actually. And so I wanted to make the theme of the barbershop an art gallery theme, right? And the overall goal is to have local artists bring their artwork in for free. And, you know, they get free advertising that people get to see their work. And I get something to separate myself from the rest of my, my competitors, right? Um, I care about every detail. Every detail is important to me. People love the shop, but there's certain things that I would love to change too. Or we'll, we'll do that on a different day. But the the music, super important to me. I spend hours picking out the right music. Like every song, I, I rarely go on random playlists. I choose every song because I'm like, if I'm sitting in a barber's chair, what would make me feel relaxed? What would make me feel good? You know? Well, and I have different playlists for different weather. So I got my rainy day playlist where I'm a little bit more jazzy. I got my sunny day playlist where I'm a little bit more upbeat. I got winter playlists. I got old school Sundays where I play nothing but 80s and 70s and 60s music. So that's super important for me. Um, I also want to give off the uh, sophisticated vibe. So I never used to have uh, a dress code before, but now I wear dress, uh, dress shirts, you know, and uh, I try to make myself a little cleaner and give it a nice high end feel, right? Because I feel like however you dress is how you're going to carry yourself. So if you if you kind of, you've got track pants on, you're going to be a little bit more loose. But if you got that dress shirt, it's very difficult yeah. to be loose. And then little details like tea tree oil on, on, the, on, on the towels, like my hot towels, I feel like that's a huge thing. I love that. Yeah, you know, so it's all about the details for me. Um, 
everything from the chairs to my signature Caesar, you know, the statue I got, that's, that's in the back. People know about that, right? And um, from the stag head, which is a traditional barber thing, like most uh, 1920s barber shops would have a stag head in it, so I wanted to put that in there. So yeah, it's all about the details, you know, uh, just merging art and haircutting, right? It's a good combination. Uh, yeah. When I come in as a client, my first thing I pick up off is the cleanliness, the mm. cleanliness of mm. the whole environment. Yeah. Having a space that is clean is, is, is crucial. Yeah. Um, and then I pick up on the music, mm. what the play, mm. how it, it affects the mood, mm -hmm. like way down when you sit in the chair, when yeah. you come in the mirror, you mm -hmm. get cut. And then it's the customer service for me. Mm -hmm. It's about how we how get treated. And like you said, you have to introduce yourself right then and there when you touch the mat. So those are just my things, just from yeah. you can see from the perspective here. Yeah. I really, really enjoy this uh, atmosphere. I really, really do. Yeah. And I love supporting it and uh, being a part of it and watching it grow. Yeah. So, yeah. I appreciate that, man. And you know what? It's crazy. What, going back to the cleanliness, um, I built the shop off of doing the opposite of everything I disliked about barbershops. Right? So everything I didn't like about a barbershop, I built the shop to be the opposite of that. So I didn't like waiting three hours for my haircut, so I made sure I had booking software. I didn't like the music being like loud and aggressive, so I made sure that I have music that makes you calm and relaxed. And I didn't like barbershops that were dirty. Like, I thought that was just the worst thing ever. Um, a old barbershop I used to go to, there would be, like, a pound of hair on the floor, and the person would put me in the chair. And I'm just thinking, like, I'm just sitting here surrounded by somebody else's hair. So um, I make a point before every single client sits in my chair, I make sure I clean off the chair and I make sure their hair is gone before I start the service. So... That's, that's very huge to me. Um, cleanliness is extremely important, especially in these times that we're going through. Um, it wasn't even much of a change to me when COVID happened because I was already doing 90% of those things. Right? So, because I think it's very important for a client's safety. I had the unfortunate um, situation in which a previous barber gave me a ringworm infection on my head. And I'll never forget that. And he played it off like he was like, oh, no, that's nothing. Uh, it's just a ringworm, just go to the doctor. And I was young, I was 18 when that happened. And that didn't really mean much to me, but I'm glad it happened because I know that I would never want to do something like that to one of my clients. So it made me really go above and beyond with my sanitation of you. Yeah. yeah, it's just those experiences that we all evolve in, right? Yeah. Um, I just want to touch on one thing as well that even when we Families come in. Mm -hmm. It's all. It's a family environment. Yeah. It's always family welcome. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I want I want moms to come up in here and feel safe. You know, I don't want them to ever come in and feel intimidated. I don't want the music to make them feel you know on edge. You know, do they have to, you know, have their kids hearing something that is inappropriate? I don't want that. You know, so I make sure all those things are taken care of. Like if a song comes on, I got even like one swear word. I'm switching the song. I don't want to hear it. You know, I can listen to that in my, in my private time. So, yeah. yeah. yeah that's really great. Very conscious of that. Yeah. You think of that. For sure. Just from the client's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I just want to say here, um, if someone out there is looking to get into barbering, mm -hmm. what is your piece of advice that you never got when you're coming into this industry? Um, honestly, specialize. specialize. That's the number one thing. Like, you got to know what you want to do. Like, there's certain things I just don't do. Like, I don't really care about designs. I don't care about coloring. I don't care about those things because I know the majority of my clients are not interested in that. So, I specialize in clean, professional haircuts. That's my number one thing. Not even so much fades. Like, I could do a fade very well, in my opinion. But I do professional, softer cuts a little bit better than I think most people. So that's been my focus since I started my career. I just want to do those cuts where the guy just has to go to work, he wants to look clean, he wants to look professional, not too aggressive. That's my style. So when you're getting into barber, you want to choose your style. What are you going to specialize in? And you also got to know your end goal. Like, are you going to be a barber? Are you going to be behind a chair for 20 years? 
Are you going to open your own shop? Are you going to move on to be a platform artist? You got to know what your angle is because if you don't, you'll be just doing random things and you're not really going to get anywhere. It's crazy because I'm not I'm not a braggadocious dude. I don't think that you know I'm super barber and that that's that's very big in this industry. A lot of barbers have like massive egos and think that's about them, but. I can say with confidence that some of the guys that used to cut my hair and that they've cut it here for over 20 years, that my skills are on their level or higher, right? So another thing is to concentrate on improving your skill constantly. You're always getting better. You always got to study. You always got to learn something new. My thing is an hour a day keeps competition away. So if you can put an hour into your craft every day, you're going to separate yourself from everybody else. Because most people are not doing that. They're like, how to cut hair? And they're like, yeah, I made it. You know, but they don't even know if the haircuts are good or not. They're just seeing what they want to see, right? So, yeah. That, that beginner's mindset almost. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always learning. Like, I always want to learn something different. Like, and for guys that are into, like, the Afro texture and whatnot, I find, like, a lot of Caribbean barbers, they only know how to cut one texture there. So you want to try to avoid that. I knew that was a major weakness when I first got in the industry, and I made sure that I learned how to cut straight hair and I learned how to cut with scissors first. And that was my main focus. I wanted to learn that because I knew that, you know, in Canada and in, even in America, the majority of people have straight hair. So I didn't want to like put myself to a very small demographic, you know. So you capitalize on your weaknesses. Right? Yeah. And then yeah. Many strengths. Exactly. That's cool. Too. I just want to say yet again, thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, for people who don't know, me, Q, and a third party member, we have a business together. And we'll be talking about uh, the business and uh, regarding the movie. Yeah. And if that's something of people's interest, mm -hmm. you can go into that as you being the CEO, being yeah. a, a creative uh, chief officer as well. So mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's an amazing experience to be in the business with you yeah. at the same time, getting people to understand who you are. And what Sharp Society means yeah. to the public. Absolutely. I just want to finish on this note. Um, two years ago, uh, I put on my vision board a barbershop, and the barbershop had uh, white walls and brown accents. And, you know, I took it down, I upgraded and whatnot, and I switched it around. But that was like the main barbershop look that I wanted to have. Today, you sit in my barbershop that has white walls and brown floors. I don't think that's an accident. I knew what I wanted, and um, I don't think I'm special. Um, I'm just getting started also, but anybody can do this. You just got to know what you want and believe in yourself and surround yourself with the right people, the right energies, and everything will, will work out. Man. Thank you for being on the show. Hey, thank you for having me, man. Likewise. All right, brother. <laughs> uh, we wrap it up. Thank you guys for watching the Fearlessly Curious Podcast. This is episode number five, featuring Q and Sharp Society. If you guys want to, I actually highly recommend it. Drop a comment on Spotify and Apple Music, leave a review for us, and at the same time, so more people can hear about the podcast and gain this knowledge.